mindful of many things that are going on in this world, mindful of the help that we still need from you to make, make it through the things that we go through. Father God, it's sickness, it's bereavement, it's uh, uh, just trials and tribulations of this life. And Father God, we pray right now where there is sickness that you would, would touch it with your healing hand, that you would uh, restore health and restore strength uh, to those who are, are dealing with various ailments right now, knowing that you are the great physician who's never lost a case. Father God, where hearts are, have been touched by loss and they're bereaving right now, Father, we pray that you would visit with them knowing that you are the God of all comfort, that you would, 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 would ease their, their troubles and ease their hearts and give them peace of mind as they deal with uh, the losses that they're, they're dealing with. Father God, where there are troubled minds right now, we pray uh, that you would touch them and, and give them understanding and give them the strength to, to go on in this walk, in this life, knowing that you are with them and that you will never leave or forsake them. Father God, we ask your blessings upon uh, your church this morning, and especially those who are going to mount the sacred desk and bring to the people a word from your holy and divine writ. Father God, we ask that you will be with uh, those churches, that you will continue to strengthen them, that they may boldly uh, go forth and do your word so that people may see their works and uh, glorify you. And Father God, we pray this morning when our time upon this earth is no more, that uh, we will hear these words come from your mouth. Well, good and well done, my faithful servant. This is our prayer right now. We ask it in the name of Jesus, who died that we might live. Amen and amen.
It is a blessing and a privilege from 
the Almighty God of heaven, that again we find ourselves on this side of the timeline of life. That for whatever reason God has chosen to do it, he has blessed us. He has showered us with his grace and his mercy and his love. And if you ever want evidence of that fact, just consider that for at least one more moment, you are among the land of the living and you are being seen and not being viewed. To those who are visiting with us here at the Northside Church of Christ, whether it's in our physical location or whether it's in our digital worship space. We just welcome you and we want you to know that you are our honored guest. And it's our prayer this morning that your visit with us will be strengthening and edifying and encouraging and that you will want to come back and be with us because you have benefited by being with us this morning. We extend to you an open invitation to, to all of our activities at Northside, both in the physical and in the digital. And wherever you find yourself able and available, just come on back and be with us as soon and as often as you possibly can. God truly is good. He has brought us to a new year. And all of the things of the old year and other years gone by uh, are in our rearview mirror. And I believe that nothing uh, but God's goodness is ahead of us in 2022. So we ought to praise God like we know that. That whatever things we may face in our upcoming days, God has already said that he would never leave us nor forsake us and that he would give us the strength and the power uh, to deal with what we deal with. And having said that, I, I do need to make this announcement. Uh, I don't know if you've been, been paying attention to uh, the news lately, but here in the city of Detroit, uh, because of this Omicron variant, uh, the city health department just announced this week that uh, there is a 36% infection rate in the city of Detroit uh, with COVID-19. And the surrounding uh, counties are uh, announcing numbers that are not quite as high, but uh, very high. And we haven't even... Uh, gotten to where they have included the numbers from the holidays yet, uh, which could very well push those numbers quite higher. So in an abundance of caution, uh, beginning next week and at least extending through the month of January, uh, we're going to go back to an online only format for our Sunday mornings. Uh, let me say that again. For the month of January, at least, we're going to go back to an online format only for our Sunday morning worship services. Now, now we, we understand that uh, at least most of our congregation has been vaccinated, uh, but this uh, variant that's uh, spreading now is scientists say up to 70 times more uh, spreadable than the previous ones. So we're going to be cautious and we don't want to be the source of anyone uh, becoming infected with COVID-19. Uh, so up through the end of January, now we will be Reevaluating uh, as January comes to a close, and God's willing, we'll be able to uh, gather again in February for Sunday morning worship. But that decision uh, will be forthcoming uh, in the upcoming week, so uh, just stay tuned, uh, and we will have uh, 
all pertinent information uh, on our Facebook feed, on our website, and uh, to our members uh, through phone calls and emails and such. I'm going to ask this morning that you'll find in your Bibles our text for the morning. It can be found in the fourth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 4. And we're going to begin reading this morning at verse 15 and reading through verse 22. Acts 15. Oh, excuse me, Acts 4, beginning at verse 15, and reading through verse 22. There the Bible reads, But when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. As the Lord has blessed each and every one of us to enter into the new year 2022. As I have been in prayer, I found myself very contemplative about the healthy and the consistent spiritual growth of this, the Lord's church. Looking back over 2021, it's probably evident to all who seek to view things with a spiritual focus that we have allowed our intensity to wane, our commitment to decrease, and our creativity to be compromised by a preoccupation of the things of this world and a misappropriation of priorities. Now, when I use that term misappropriation of priorities, I simply mean this. Those of us who have been baptized into Christ did so willingly, not under the threat uh, uh, physical harm or compulsion not under any compulsion other than that of the Holy Spirit we voluntarily committed our lives to Jesus Christ and using a spiritual metaphor we put our hands to the plow and it's important here to note the words of Jesus when he says in Luke 9 and verse 62, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. 
As a matter of fact, the word of God is clear on this subject of falling back into the pattern of the world being distasteful to God. Peter wrote to the early church in 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 20, if they have accepted the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud. And so then, it is safe to conclude that the will of God is not that we would get in the church and to maintain the same lifestyle and values and actions that identified us before we voluntarily and willingly were baptized into Christ. In essence, we are to be witnesses to the world of who Christ is and what Christ offers and why a life apart from Christ is a life that is without power and without hope and without promise. Understand me this morning. No matter how big your bank account is, no matter how large your home is, no matter how prestigious your accomplishments are, without Christ, your life is nothing. No matter how big your heart is, how generous your spirit is, and how deep your love is, without Christ, your life is nothing. And no matter how deep your thoughts are and how profound your conclusions are, without Christ, your life is nothing. And to have Christ in your life means that you need to have a healthy, abiding, spirit-filled, cooperative, and progressive relationship with his church. His church is important. Matter of fact, his church is necessary. And his church is the vehicle where God shapes us and makes us and equips us and challenges us to serve. Think about it this way. What good is a child who shows respect and understanding and who takes directions from those in the street but refuses to take direction from those who are called to care for them in their own house? What good is a father or mother who serves everyone outside their house, who nurtures the young in their community but won't lift a finger to serve or nurture those in their house? God demands from us solid and consistent growth. And he has given us the wherewithal that will assist us in this journey. And on top of all of that, he has sent his son to provide hope. He has sacrificed his son to provide redemption. And he has given his son a seat on the right hand of him to guide us and provide us with power. God wants, no, 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 let me say it like this. God needs and demands a strong church. And the prayer of Northside in 2022 ought to be this. Lord, give us strength. Now, we don't have to be a big church, but God, make us a strong church. 
We don't have to be a rich church. But God, make us a strong church. We don't have to be a popular church. But God, make us a strong church. I want us to go to our, our text this morning. I want to give you a quick overview of what's revealed there. The Bible lets us know that Peter and John, who are both apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, sat in the church at Jerusalem. They had been arrested. And they weren't arrested for some, some crime that they've committed. They were arrested simply because they had the nerve to preach Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. They were arrested because the opportunity to preach was gained when God, through his servants Peter and John, who were going about their routine, were given the opportunity to heal a man who sat by the temple gates and was asking alms of people as they went in. But as a result of their preaching an unpopular message, many who heard them preached the word, believed. And about 5,000 people were added to their number. Which means this, because of the 3,000 in Acts 2, the church there in Jerusalem is numbering over 8,000 folk. And Peter and John, because of this, have been placed in jail. But they were given an opportunity to stand before the Sanhedrin. Now, now for those who don't know, the Sanhedrin was, was a type of supreme court for the Jews. And as Peter and John stand before the Sanhedrin, they did not waver. They acknowledged God's power that was made manifest in the one who was healed. And on top of that, they declared their intention to continue to preach Jesus even in the face of opposition. See, they understood something. See, they understood, according to verse 12 of chapter 4, that the name of Jesus must be preached. For there is none other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This brings us to point number one in this short, this short sermon this morning. We need to ask God to make us a strong church in our understanding. Somehow, we have to get to the point where we understand that the cause of Christ has to be made manifest in this world through our actions. We have to understand that Christ has no feet but our feet. That Christ has no hands but our hands. That Christ has no mouth but our mouths. And Christ has no income or resources but our income and resources. Now, now am I being sacrilegious when I say this? God has already said, if I needed money, I wouldn't ask you for it. Hey, God, two and eight, God declares, all the gold and the silver in the mines is mine. Again, if he were hungry, he declared in Psalms, the 50th division, I would not tell you. Why? Because every beast of the forest is his and the cattle of a thousand hills is his as well. But what God is saying contextually here is he doesn't need our sacrifice to survive. But he desires them. Why? Because they show our understanding of who he is and why he's worthy of our sacrifice. 
Let me illustrate it to you this way. Both of my sons grew up, especially Robert, loving French fries. Always has loved them. And still, even at 19 years old, he could eat them day and night at any meal and at any time. And because of this, when, when, when they were younger, every now and then on my way home from work or wherever I was, I, I would stop by McDonald's or somewhere and, and get him some fries. And when I got home, his face would light up. Why? Because daddy got him some french fries. And I would give them to him and every now and then I might say, Robert, let me have a fry. Now, here's where understanding comes in. When I asked him, Robert, let me have a fry, he could say, sure, Dad, and bring me the fries and, and let me get as much as I want. He could pull out a fry and say, here, Dad. Or he could exercise another option. Dang, Daddy, if you wanted some, why didn't you just get you some? Now, my question to this audience is simply this. Do I need that fry from my young son? Think about it. I'm the one who drove to McDonald's. I'm the one who stepped up to the counter. I'm the one who placed the order. I'm the one who reached into my pocket and, and gave cash or my debit card to the cashier. I'm the one who drove home. I'm the one who called him. And I'm the one who lovingly gave him the fries. And watch this. All of this was done in the context of me thinking about my son and how happy he would be when he got this blessing. And surely, he ought not to have a second thought about giving me a french fry. Yeah, yeah. I could have got all the fries that my resources would have allowed me to. And, and, and understand this. God's resources never run out. That's why he said, all the cattle is mine. All the gold is mine. All the silver is mine. It's not that God needs you, but rather an understanding on your part and my part that we ought to show a spirit of thanksgiving and appreciation for what we have and what we are, and we ought to be willing to sacrifice what he gives us for his glory. Look at these folk in the text. Peter and John were threatened by some folk who actually could do something to them. And this was their response when they were told that they could not talk about Jesus anymore. Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. To obey you rather than God. That's an understanding. And God wants us to have that type of understanding today. How do we get there though? Well, first of all, God says be faithful. Over in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, God tells the Apostle John, Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and some of you will suffer persecution for 10 days. But be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you a crown of life. God also says, be diligent. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to him must believe that he is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He also says, be different. First Peter 2 and 9 says this, 
but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God also says, walk like you got some good sense and make use of your time. Know what I expect of you and maintain the right spirit of thankfulness and submission in the church. Paul writes in Ephesians 5, beginning at verse number 15. He says, walk like you got some good sense. Make good use of your time. Know what I expect of you and maintain the right spirit of thankfulness and submission in the church. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. This morning, I just want to ask the question, are you obeying God? God has to say to some of us sometime, I, I really don't know what to do with you. You, don't, you ain't on fire. You ain't even ice cold. You're just lukewarm. You're not really, really bad, but you're not really good either. You're not really in, but you're not really out. You're not really with me, but you're not really against me. And I need to assure you this morning, that's not safe ground. Are you obeying God? And if not, he needs to make you strong in your understanding. But that also brings to us a second point. We need God to make us strong in our commitment as well. Webster's Dictionary defines commitment this way. Commitment is the state or the instance of being obligated or emotionally impelled as in. In order to be a strong church, we must be a committed church. In order to be a strong Christian, we must be a committed Christian. And as we look at our text here, it's very clear to see that Peter and John are committed. Look at how strong their commitment is. They're willing to face the threats. They're willing to endure prison time. They're willing to experience separation from friends and loved ones all for the cause of Jesus Christ. And that shows deep personal commitment. No, 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 no. I, I don't want you to get it twisted because I, I, I already understand that we know what commitment is. As Americans, we're real good at showing commitment. Most of us get up every morning and head out to jobs faithfully in order to provide for our families and our general welfare. Why? Because we're committed to having the best life we can have. We generally work hard at whatever it is we do, whether it's the job or whether it's other things, because we're committed to those jobs or professions. And if you're, you, you're, you're, you have good sense, you're committed to something or somebody. But here's the problem. Although we know we ought to be committed to doing our very best in whatever it is we do, when it comes to serving God, is our commitment at least as strong as that? We'll go to work sick as a dog, but won't do something for the Lord because we got a hangnail. Mm -hmm. 
we'll go to our fraternity sorority events. After being up all night, throwing up, headaches, all kind of stuff. Folk even here doing stuff like that with COVID-19 infections. But let me get to sniffles. I can't show up to assemble with the saints. I need to make this clear. You cannot have a good, healthy relationship with Christ and not have a healthy relationship and being committed to his church. Yes, Christ is important, but his church is just as important as well. And not only that, not only is his church important and ought to be important to us, it's important to Christ. How important is it to Christ? I'm glad you asked that question. First of all, it was so important to Christ that he built it. Matthew 16 and 16 says, And I say also to thee, thou, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Sounds to me like his church is important. It doesn't stop there. The church is so important, number two, that he purchased it or bought it with his own blood. Acts 20 and 28 says this, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Sounds again like the church is important to Christ. Goes on even further. It's so important to Christ, number three, that he's the head of it. Ephesians 1, and 23 says this, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And if we're going to be a strong church, we have to be committed to the church. Just as Christ was committed to the church. And I want to just throw this out here. We're going to be done for this morning. We, we, we will continue this next week. If you don't want to be committed for yourself, then at least think about those who are coming behind you. Think about your children. Think about those others who are coming behind you. And it's a biblical commandment. It's not a suggestion. It's not spiritual advertisement, but it's a command. Paul put it this way in Ephesians 6, beginning at verse number 1. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And we'd like to stop right there. But if you read on, there's a commandment for us as well. He says, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, it's, again, it's no secret that we typically want our children to do better than we do. We send them to school so they can have a good life and hopefully a better life than the one we had. We help them get jobs, we help them get training, we help them get education so that they can go out and do better than we did. Again, let me ask the question, do we train them in the spiritual realm at least as well as we do to prepare them for the world? And if we don't get a good understanding of how important that commitment to Christ and his church is, the church we end up with tomorrow won't be any stronger than the one we have right now. 
Now that doesn't mean that, that, that for some reason Christ Church is going to go out of business because we don't do what we're supposed to do. Christ Church is around forever. But I'm talking about where you are right now, where you assemble. Is it going to be better or worse due to your influence and your training of those who come behind you? We already know that whatever spiritual DNA that we pass down, those spiritual traits that we pass down is going to be what influences our children for Christ as they grow up. And the question to you this morning, what's it going to be? We give our children understanding and have them to be committed in every other facet of life. If you understood the need to teach your child how to brush their teeth and wash their face before they left the house every morning, if you understood the need to teach your child how to treat uh, uh, people, how to be honest and how to work for a living, you ought to understand the need to, to, to instill in your child some spiritual training as well. You already know how it is. You can't come home late every other day and tell your child how it is, how important it is for them to be on time for school. You ain't never on time for work. Because your actions show louder than your words show what's truly important. And if your actions toward Christ and his church show that it's not important, that it's nothing more than some ritualistic exercise that really has no meaning because you only show up when you want to or when it's convenient for you and you show up as late as you want to and you don't actively participate like you ought to, what do you think is going to come after you? Church, we have to be stronger in our understanding, number one, of who God is and why he's worthy of all that we can do for him. Again, God doesn't need you, but God wants you. He wants you so much that he's given you all that you need. And all he asks for you is to sacrifice some of what he's given you that you need in appreciation and thanksgiving for what he's done for you. And then we need to be stronger in our commitment. God has been so committed to us that the little commitment that he wants out of us ought to be no big hardship for us. How committed to, was God to you? Run over to Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 with me real quick as we close this thing out. Let me show you how committed God was to you. Paul writes this to the Roman church. For God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why did he do that for you? Jesus himself said over in John 3.16, he, he made it so very plain. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God loved you, and he loved you to the extent that he gave his son for you. And he did it while you were still in sin, while you were still in rebellion to him. If that's not commitment, I don't know what is. God did all of that for you. 
and you can't show up for God because it ain't convenient for you? God did all of that for you, and you can't show up for God because something else has your attention, that when you're gone, they didn't forget about you already even before you're gone, before your usefulness to them has expired. You see, I, I'm committed to certain things. I'm committed to my job, but guess what? If I expire tomorrow, somebody else would be sitting in my classroom and in my office probably before the day is over. I'm committed to my fraternity. But if I die tomorrow, guess what? It won't be long before the memory of John Mayberry has been erased from their minds. And they've gone on with what they're going to do. I'm committed to my family. But even if I expire tomorrow, my memory might hang on for the rest of their lives. But guess what? They've gone on with their lives. Christ's commitment to you is not fleeting like that. Again, Christ has already told us, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. In other words, I'm with you to the end. Talk about a ride or die. You ain't seen a ride or die until you've lived with Christ. Because no matter what it is, he's going to be with you through it all. And all he asks of you is for some commitment to go along with the total commitment that he's given to you. To put his commitment your commitment to him first because he's committed to you all. And if you find that you're not there in your commitment with Christ, if you find that you're not there in your understanding of why you need to be committed to him that way, now is the time to come to him. Lord, make me stronger. Lord, I've fallen short. Forgive me. And give me the strength that I need to be what you want me to be. If you're not a child of God this morning, we've already told you. We've already made it plain that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you while you were still in sin. Now, that's an amazing thing. And I just put it like this all the time, and I'm going to say it again today. If somebody was willing to die for you, ought you not to be willing to live for them? It's the height of ingratitude for somebody to love you so much that they're willing to give their life for you. And you to understand that. And you to turn your back in, on them and say, oh, well. Christ died for you. You ought to be willing to live for him. How do I do that, brother preacher? I'm so glad you asked. You've already heard how he came and how he died for your sins. But the story doesn't stop there. He was buried in a borrowed tomb on a Friday afternoon. Stayed in that tomb Friday night. Stayed in that tomb all Saturday. But somewhere on Sunday morning, the scriptures let us know that he arose from that tomb, from that grave, alive with all power in his hand. 
and right now he's seated on the side of the Father, the right side of the Father, making intercession for us right now. The Christ that died for your sins is alive and he's alive forevermore. Believe what you just heard. Let that belief lead you to repent of your sins. And that just simply means that you change or you turn away from them. You turn around. You have a new direction. You have a new focus. And that focus is on Jesus Christ. Let that belief lead you to confession. And that's where you stand in agreement with God that Jesus indeed is the Christ and that he's God's son. And let it lead you to baptism for the remission of all of your sins. I don't care how big or how many they are. All of them would be washed away by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And if you live in him faithfully, one day heaven will be your home. You will be with him for all eternity in peace. Is that your desire this morning? And if it is, let it be known right now as we stand together and as we sing his song of invitation. Won't you come to Jesus right now? Let us stand. Thank you, thank you, Lord. We just want to say thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord.
disciples and said take eat this is my body and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink ye all of it but this is my blood of the new testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins but i say unto you i will not drink his forth this fruit of the vine until that day when i drink it new with you in my father's kingdom let us pray Heavenly Father, we are thankful for thy son's sacrifice upon the cross. Father, we ask as we take these emblems, which represent your son's broken body and shed blood, that we may do so with clean hands and a pure heart. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask it all. Amen. Let us remember in the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And here at the Church of Christ at Northside, we have several options in which you may give your offering, such as bank pay, cash app, and PayPal. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the many blessings that Thou has bestowed upon us. Father, as we use these gifts pleasing and acceptable to Thee, we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
and praise to you has been acceptable in your sight and if not we ask that you forgive us and show us a more perfect way and God we pray right now that as we depart this place whether it's the physical or the digital that we will never depart your presence that you will always be watchful over us and protective over us until the next time we come again it's in Jesus name we pray it amen <laughs> 